Hi, everybody. Eve Harrow, Rejuvenation on the Land of Israel Network. Um, when you are hearing this, I'm actually going to be in England at Leamwood, UK. So I've pre-taped this show on Thursday, December something, December 20th, I think. Um, I'm sitting in the Jerusalem office of Chaim Silverstein, someone who I've known for many, many years and uh, who is the founder and head of Keep Jerusalem. He unfortunately has been in the news the past couple of weeks because he's also the father of Shira Isha and the father-in-law of Amichai, and of course, the grandfather of Amiyad Yisrael, who only survived for three days after being murdered by terrorists a couple of weeks ago um, in the Shomron. So um, Chaim has graciously said that I could come and speak to him for a few minutes. Uh, and first, uh, but first I would like to talk about um, what what Keep Jerusalem is. And because uh, there's a lot of people in Israel who know who you are, uh, not just in Israel, but outside the world who know you who you are because of your t- t- incredible devotion to Yerushalayim, to Jerusalem, the many years that you've worked for Jerusalem. So I would first like my listeners to hear about some of the some of the tremendous work you've been doing for the people of Israel in the land of Israel, in our holy city. Uh, and then we'll talk, if it's okay, maybe a little bit about um, about the last couple of weeks. So first of all, what is, what is your organization? Hi, Eve. Thank you very much for hosting me. As we've seen over the last few weeks, there's a, an intense battle that's going on uh, for the land of Israel, uh, which unfortunately is uh, uh, expressed in many ways, military um, and public diplomacy uh, in the opinions of people's minds and hearts. And it's a struggle that uh, often we're not winning. Uh, thank God when it comes to holding on to the land, uh, we we are doing that, even though we often have to fight against our own government and certainly against uh, nations around the world. But in the uh, courtroom of the mind, uh, uh, public opinion around the world, there are many, many people that think that we need to give up on the land of Israel in general and on Jerusalem in particular to divide up Jerusalem, to let the Palestinians create a state with Jerusalem as its capital. And we think this would be a disaster for the Jewish people, for the state of Israel, and for all freedom-loving people around the world, and certainly those people who hold the Bible dear. And uh, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I established an organization called Keep Jerusalem, which does public diplomacy um, and advocacy work, uh, trying to educate um, politicians, media people, and general Jews and Gentiles around the world as to the importance of keeping Jerusalem united and secure and strong. And after what's happened to us recently, our resolve and our realization how important this is is only being strengthened. So over the years, I've come on tours with you around Jerusalem. I've also sent other people that I've worked with because you, I think, are probably considered one of the experts on Jerusalem, on not just on the city itself, but on each house, on where the international ceasefire lines run, on where Israel has actually annexed the area, on neighborhoods that Palestinian Arabs have moved into illegally from, let's say, Judea and Samaria, because they want to be in Jerusalem. They actually want a lot of the rights that Israelis have and a lot of the health funds and the education. And so what we have around Jerusalem is like a a really crazy situation. And I know that you are really considered uh, house to house, even street to street, and working with Arya King, who's a member of uh, the Jerusalem City Council on that. So when when people come, let's say diplomats come here or news people, do they find you? Do you find them? Like, do they want to learn or, you know, and and search you out because they know that they'll get facts from you? Or do you have to go search them out? Because we seem to be living in a situation where people would rather not know things because then they can hold on to their own incorrect opinions. Well, that's a good question. And um, the first thing I realized when I got involved with this area, Hasbara, advocacy and public dip- diplomacy work, is that there's a big gap between the way people perceive Jerusalem and the realities on the ground. And to my distress, uh, I suppose, I realized that this gap in knowledge and information exists very much in the Israeli Knesset, in our <laughs> our leaders and our opinion uh, leaders and decision makers, and many attitudes and opinions that are being formed among people that make decisions and form policies 
are based on misinformation, lack of facts, distortions, and and just sheer ignorance. Um, so we set a, 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 a go- set a goal to first and foremost educate our own people, our own leaders, our own citizens, and to get them on to the correct side. In other words, to understand the facts and realize, hopefully, from understanding the facts, that what a, a, a disaster and a tragedy it would be if, God forbid, Jerusalem was divided and handed over to a hostile Palestinian entity. So a lot of our work is, um, is uh, uh, targeting these VIPs. Some of them approach us, but mostly we approach uh, them, and, uh, or certainly in the past, we approached them, offered them these tours, and many of them, uh, dozens of members of Knesset, for example, have taken up um, the the offer and have come with me on tours. and And thank God, the uh, the educational process has been amazing. Even with people that are considered right wing in the Knesset, you know, people like Yoav Kish, who's the head of the the Land of Israel Caucus, came with me and was very grateful that I put things in order for him. Tipi Chotaveli, the deputy uh, foreign minister came with me and told me over and over again how you know, grateful she was that I took what they knew intuitively and through the visuals got them to understand it in a very fundamental way. So um, uh, at this point, thank God, we've managed to build up our, our advocacy and Hasbara work to the extent that I'm now a, a regular client with the Foreign Ministry and the Jerusalem, Minist- the Jerusalem Affairs Ministry who send me um, diplomats and, and um, different delegations and media people, and I have the opportunity to educate them. And I cannot overestimate uh, the value of, of this kind of work. If you are a person who does that extensively in Judea and Samaria, so you know what I'm talking about, but uh, unfortunately they're not uh, any other, there is no other organization center right of the political spectrum that does this Hasbara work, this advocacy work in, for Jerusalem. On the left-hand side of the political spectrum, there's many. There's at least five organizations that spend their you know, hard-earned uh, money of European citizens and George Soros and others uh, who, who generously fund them to persuade the world and the Israelis how much we need to divide uh, Jerusalem and give away our holy sites to international control or Palestinian control. And, and this is something that we are trying to combat. How about the army? Do you get, uh, in addition to the politicians, of course, a major player here in Israel, is the army or and the police, the security services, because dividing Jerusalem or where people live in Jerusalem isn't just a matter of control or of sovereignty, but it also has a lot to do, of course, with danger and with security. Um, so do they come to you as well, or do you do you take soldiers around? Does the army take soldiers around based on some of the information that you give? We also have a unique situation in Jerusalem, if you're familiar with it, with that we have border, we have what we call the Magav, uh, the border police, where some, there's something in between soldiers and policemen specifically for especially the old city and some of the high-tension, high-conflict areas in Jerusalem. Do you have any, uh, any a connection with them? I have had a little bit in the past um, and briefed some of the senior officers in the army. This is an area that I would love to be involved with, but uh, unfortunately you need quite a big budget in order to work with them because unless you really provide them with buses mm-hmm. and with you know lunches and things like that, uh, they're not so eager to come with you. Um, so it's just that, that's it's a funding issue as well as... Uh, you know, having the right connections. I believe if we had the funding, we would be able to bring a lot of soldiers on these tours. Um, police, we've had less less contact with uh, on this this area. Uh, we are currently doing a joint project with MTU2, which is a large, you know, right wing student organization in Israel. And we've brought thousands of students to Jerusalem, and we're educating them um, about about the issues, the geopolitics of Jerusalem, because we realize that, you know, the younger generation are just, you know, being exposed to social media, which are giving really negative um, narratives mm-hmm. about about Jerusalem. And so we're trying to balance that out. And journalists, do you have uh, people approach you for that? Yes. So I, I've done a lot of uh, media work with, with journalists, um, 
uh, Bloomberg, New York Times, um, uh, many TV stations from around the world. Um, it's, a, it's also very important work. Uh, unfortunately, they have uh, editors back in their hometowns and cities that are, are not always happy for them to get the, the, the truth uh, because they, they, they're not always eager to, to supply the truth to their viewers and their listeners. But uh, again, we try and, and work with media. We send out uh, invitations. Some people take it up. Uh, but usually I hear from them when there's some kind of tragedy, disaster, flashpoint happening, uh, and then they'll, you know, then they'll try and uh, do something with us, but with their own angle. So it's an uphill battle with them. Mm -hmm. well, one of the major neighborhoods, as, as it is, uh, outside Jerusalem right now is Shuafat, which is actually under the control, it's considered a refugee camp, it's under the control of UNRWA. Do you think anything's going to happen now that UNRWA maybe will be defunded? Is there anything there that you think will change the status of what's happening in that part of the city? Okay, so let's uh, let me uh, share with you a, a factual, uh, first of all, a factual uh, correction. The area we're talking about is known as the Shuafat refugee camp. There is actually a large uh, Arab neighborhood in Jerusalem, in north of Jerusalem, not far from the Shuafat refugee camp, called Shuafat. Um, the Shuafat refugee camp is actually quite a small area. In a larger area, a larger Arab neighborhood, which is known as Ras Khamis. And those two neighborhoods, plus another couple small ones, are located outside of the security barrier surrounding Jerusalem, but still within the municipal borders of Jerusalem. It's a very complicated uh, situation. So in this area called Ras Khamis slash Shuafat refugee camp, which is situated outside the fence, but still inside Jerusalem, live about 70,000 Arabs. Wow. And that is... Uh, a very complex demographic, security, and political situation. The number of Arabs that live in, in the actual, secure, actual refugee camp, which is known as the Shuafat refugee camp, which, by the way, was not established under Israelis. It was established during King Hussein's uh, control in the 60s when he evicted Arabs from the old city and put them in a camp next door, Shuafat. That's how it got its name. Uh, Israel has got nothing to do with it and it's got nothing to do with the 1948 war. Um, but um, this whole phenomenon of the 70,000 Arabs that live in this Ras Khamis Shuafat refugee camp neighborhood is a huge problem for Israelis and most Israeli governments, in fact all the Israeli governments up to now have just ignored this festering wound that's happening uh, there. There's another neighborhood in a similar circumstance in the very north of Jerusalem, with the same kind of setup called Kafir Aqab, uh, which is right in the very northern tip of Jerusalem, which also has the Kalandia refugee camp adjacent to it, also grew from 7,000 to 70,000 residents and outside the security barrier inside the Jerusalem border. So you have a situation of 140,000 Arabs who are outside the fence but inside the Jerusalem municipality with Hamas active there, with crime, drugs, and a lot of bad stuff going on in these areas, and the Israeli government doing very, very little about it. Wow, that's really shocking. I uh, A couple of years ago, I actually went on a tour with Arya King to some of these areas, and I also interviewed him last year about the Israel Lands Fund, which shows that there is many much Jewish owned land like we talk about these refugee camps that were established by the Jordanians all refugee camps incidentally were established by Arabs for Arabs uh not not by Israel and that there is a lot of land in Jerusalem that is legally owned by Jews but we can't find them they maybe bought it before the Holocaust. British Jews and others from the 20s and 30s who perhaps were killed in the Holocaust, they're, if they had any descendants, they don't know about it. So uh, what, what are you doing on a legal level here? Because everybody's, you know, we've had Jewish communities that are destroyed because half of a house is on maybe so-called Palestinian-owned land. And then we've had Nitiv Avot and Migron and Amona destroyed. But in Jerusalem itself, uh, just on that legal basis, you do have land that is being lived on by Arabs, but is owned by Jews. So li laws are laws. How how do you work on that in order to perhaps solve some of those problems just on, on a legal basis? It's not even ideology here. 
So yes, uh, Eve, I, I, on various projects, I, Aria King's organization, my organization, mm -hmm. collaborate. We've been working together for at least the last 15 years. Um, but however, what I uh, kind of had a epiphany about uh, about 10 years ago uh, was the realization that the demographic and security and political problems that are facing Jerusalem, in order to be effectively dealt with, need to be dealt with by the government. Mm -hmm. And the government has ignored uh, the East Jerusalem situation for so many years because of Obama pressure, because of various prime ministers that thought that Jerusalem was going to be divided anyhow, so they just ignored it or neglected it. And this wound has festered and has grown to the extent that today, in the area known as Eastern Jerusalem, which is the area that was liberated in the Six-Day War, included in the current municipal borders, live about 320,000 Arabs, which constitute 40% of the total population of Jerusalem. This is a what I call a demographic Trojan horse. And if this trend continues, and by the way, the number of Jews in Jerusalem continues to diminish because of lack of affordable housing and employment opportunities, Jews are leaving Jerusalem. And as you mentioned earlier, Arabs are coming to Jerusalem mm -hmm. to receive social security benefits and employment opportunities. So we have a, a situation where the number of Arabs is, clo is quickly approaching 50% of the population and the number of Jews is diminishing. This is a problem which I, uh, as my, my personally and as, as an organization, we are confronting. And I put together a team about two years ago of experts in on Jerusalem, world experts in international law like Ambassador Alan Baker and Eugene Kontorovich and uh, um, Nadav Shragai, a famous expert on Jerusalem, and uh, Yoram Ettinger and uh, General Gershon Cohen, people in various disciplines. And we came up with a policy uh, paper which we submitted to the Israeli government. Um, and this, we hope, will try and solve the, the problems on a macro level. It's true that this particular problem uh, property had a Jewish owner, mm -hmm. uh, and we and on that level we try and reclaim and return these properties to their rightful Jewish owners. And I'm um, in fact just before you came in, I was talking to my lawyer, one of our lawyers, in in a, a court case we've got coming up um, next Sunday. But we need a systematic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, macro solution to the problem. In the uh, policy paper, we recommended a, a number of uh, solutions which we hope will change the demographics of Jerusalem from its current 60% Jewish, 40% Arabs to 85% Jewish or 90% Jewish and 15 or 10% Arab. Can you elaborate on how you're doing that? Do you, are you changing, are you gerrymandering the city? Are you changing where different neighborhoods, some are in or some are out? Because based on what you're saying, somebody could say, you know what, Jerusalem might be reunited post-67, but de facto on the ground, it's a divided city. And I know that all of us feel there are certain neighborhoods in Jerusalem that we don't go into, um, but it's still Jerusalem. And so when someone will come to me, and I'll play devil's advocate for a second here, and say, listen, and, and even when we had a wave of stabbings a few years ago, the Israeli government or someone made the decision to put in barricades between, let's say, Surbah here and Jebel Mukaber and Talpiot, so the neighborhoods that are adjacent to each other because there was so much, so many, so much terror coming out of there. So it seems like your plan, if it can make you a shalim, uh, however way a Jewish majority would be the way to go because the current situation is not sustainable. Correct. And we had a real problem because, and that's why I put together a team that was made of people that are not even necessarily considered right wing, um, because we, need, we had to figure out a way that it was both democratic, legal, we'd pass the, the leftist Israeli Supreme Court um, you know, uh, in, oh. Institute and, uh, and, 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 and would also solve the problem and perhaps most importantly was implementable. You know, like a lot of people come up to him and say, well, I've got an easy solution. Just, you know, kick out the Arabs. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe from a gut feeling point of view, it's, it's good to think that way, but it's not going to happen practically. So we had to figure out a way. So we came up with three main recommendations. And again, they're not necessarily ideal, but we had to figure out a way that we could solve this problem and quickly. Because if, for example, we don't change the demographics, 
in the next municipal elections, which are five years down the road, and the Arabs are already at close to 50% of the population, they could wake up one day and say, you know what, our strongest weapon is democracy. We've got ID books. The Arabs of Jerusalem, by the way, can vote for municipal elections. Most of them cannot vote for the Knesset. they permanent residents, but they can vote for municipal elections. And they can turn around and say, you know what, we're going to now defeat the Jews in the ballots box. And then they'll, and Hamas and Fatah will say, yes, this is a good weapon. Up to now, they've boycotted the elections. And they could vote in a Hamas mayor of Jerusalem, democratically voted. And in fact, these uh, past elections now that have just ended in, in November, already two Arabs for the first time in 51 years, ran for the municipal council. And that, you can see there's now a trend. So our goal is to try and put a stop to that in the short term. In the long term, construction and bringing Jews to Jerusalem obviously is a solution. So the three main recommendations are the following. Number one, to uh, begin a huge construction wave uh, of Jewish homes and apartments, affordable, in the peripherals of Jerusalem, areas like Ramot and Pisgat Ze'ev and Neve Yaakov and Gilo and East Tal Piot, we, we did extensive research and we supplied the government and the Jerusalem Development Authority with uh, a 20-page a research showing exactly how many units they can build in every neighborhood or sub-neighborhood, and there are 400 of them in Jerusalem. And, and this is on land that's that's clear. There's no question about who owns it. There, there's no bureaucratic snafu down uh, in terms of the legalities of the land. By and large, yet yeah, it's government-owned land or private-owned land. There might need to be some kind of uh, you know uh, evac rezoning. rezoning and stuff done. Yes, but we there, there's over a hundred thousand units that can be built in the next fifteen years, and we recommended. We said, you know what, there'll be a sixty or seventy percent exploitation rate. He has a way that you can build 60,000 units, mm-hmm. and we rec- recommended the government to do that. That was point number one. Point number two is a plan which we didn't invent, which I'm sure you're familiar about, and that's called the Greater Jerusalem Plan. And this is a way of expanding the borders of Jerusalem to include uh, satellite towns around Jerusalem, towns like Malea Dumim, Givat Ze'ev, the Gush Etzion area, Beitar Elite, and even Mevaseretzion in the West, and if they could be incorporated in a greater Jerusalem municipality, what we call an umbrella municipality, similar to what you have in London, Paris, Mm -hmm. San Francisco, New York, uh, where you have a kind of borough situation where you have one mayor of the whole town, but you have boroughs that have their own administration and management so that they wouldn't feel that they've lost their independence. That would add on another quarter of a million Jews to Jerusalem. Um, the construction wave would add on another 200,000 Jews to Jerusalem. And the third um, recommendation we made, which also is can be immediately implemented, is the rezoning, uh, or you mentioned the word gerrymandering, redistricting of those two areas that are outside the um, security barriers, the Ras Hamis Shwafat refugee camp and Kafir Aqab in the north, which have uh, together 140,000 Arabs living in them in actually a relatively very small area. Now, ideologically, we are against giving away any land to so-called Palestinians or to any foreign entity. And therefore, our recommendation is to actually create new municipalities, Israeli municipalities, uh, for these neighborhoods, just like Abu Ghosh and other Arab towns, and they would be under the Israeli um, Interior Ministry, and they would receive separate budgets, but they would be legally outside the municipality of Jerusalem. This would reduce the number of Arab neighbor uh, voters in Jerusalem from three hundred twenty thousand to uh, one hundred forty thousand less, and that would have a, an immediate and significant effect on the ability of the Arabs to take over the city. Mm. Not to mention, of course, that anybody who's been living and getting money from the world as a so-called refugee, at some point that problem has to be solved, and people who are refugees need to be resettled. You can't have it both ways. You can't take money for 70 years as a refugee, and then when someone has an idea, and hopefully someone will, to resettle you, to say no, it doesn't cut both ways. So that would also help to lower that. But, I, you know, I remember, like the Atarot Airport, for example, which is 
technically in Jerusalem is now closed for security reasons because we can't have planes landing in Jerusalem. I remember taking a flight out of Jerusalem years ago. Is there is there a plan for the airport that you have? And also, you mentioned before, it's one thing to build housing for Jews in Jerusalem, but they're not going to stay if they can't work. So on the one hand, what's very important is we have the high-speed train now from Tel Aviv. It's got some kinks to work out, but someone could technically live in Jerusalem and in a half an hour be in Tel Aviv, and therefore you could have Jerusalem even be somewhat of a suburbia for Tel Aviv and the tremendous work opportunities there. But does your plan also include industrial zones or other kind of high-tech areas? We already have a couple, Har Chutzvim and Malcha, in order to also make the population of Jerusalem stronger because... Right now, in addition to the Arabs, we have a very large ultra-Orthodox population, which is a, tends to be a poor one because many of the men don't work, and that's another whole topic that the government's working on. But I'm thinking really of the viability of your plan, which sounds incredible, but in a larger sense, we need schools, you need jobs. Is that all included in your plan as well? Yes. So first of all, to the Atarot issue, uh, unfortunately, Atarot Airport was closed in the, at the uh, beginning of the second intifada in the year 2000 when it was perceived there was a security uh, threat. Today, unfortunately, when you drive past there, you'll see that there are Arab buses that are parked on the runway and u- being used as a parking lot for these buses, which is just you know another thing to be angry about. However, um, there uh, is a plan for that whole area, which is the northernmost part of Jerusalem, the Atarot area, which is next to a large industrial zone, to create a 15,000-unit Haredi ultra-Orthodox neighborhood right in and around the Atarot airport. This is a plan that was first tabled in the time of Uri Lupliansky when he was the mayor of Jerusalem. Uh, it was even accepted by, in principle by the city hall, but never implemented. He himself is Haredi. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Nir Barkat paid some lip service to it uh, recent in last Yom Yerushalayim, the Jerusalem day, when he also brought up this neighborhood and said they're going to work on it. But unfortunately, it needs really government um, decisions and implementation, and we pushing on on that area. So, and it's very important because north of Jerusalem has almost no Jewish um, residential areas. The closest one is Neve Yaakov and Pisgat Ze'ev, which are northern Jerusalem, and uh, it needs to be uh, implemented even northern, north of that, next to the Atarot area. As for those who aren't familiar, Ramallah is just north of Jerusalem and is expanding all the time. So if we don't take that land north of Jerusalem, it's going to get grabbed, as they have in so many areas, by the Palestinian Authority. Correct. And so th- that's certainly something that we're working on and pushing on. With regards to the employment and other infrastructure, we did, we did relate to that in our plan. But um, the Jerusalem Development Authority, the government, and many other serious uh, government or non-government organizations have been working on finding employment and fixing up the infrastructure. So we didn't really get into that in great detail. Uh, if you're familiar, at the entrance to Jerusalem, there are 12 high-rise buildings uh, for commerce and and. Um, hotels and residentials that are planned. Uh, there's a, a new access roads to Jerusalem that have been planned. The Really, the uh, area that the government has been lax on, unfortunately, is residential. In other words, they're planning all these great things to provide uh, employment, but they never and have not until recently um, planned and implemented major construction uh, uh, zones and areas in Yerushalayim. And this is what we have managed to contribute to try and you know complete the picture to fix up the the terrible demographic uh, threats that are facing Jerusalem today. So yes, if we build those sixty thousand units and the we develop all the commercial and industrial potential that that Jerusalem has, and bringing a lot of the defense ministry offices to Jerusalem, which is planned, also a, de- a decision has been made but not yet implemented then the employment and and transportation infrastructure will be in place in order to support the the large increased number of uh, of uh, uh, of residents in Jerusalem also mobile eye um you know the big uh, uh, autonomous driving and accident prevention company that was bought out by intel for 15 billion dollars is planning a 40 story 
building and another eight buildings in the Har uh, high-tech area, which is going to uh, supply, that alone is going to supply at least another two and a half, three thousand 3,000 jobs. Wow. So these are big plans, but Jerusalem deserves no less. I know one of the other issues, because as a tour guide, I meet people all the time, that we have between fifty and 60,000 apartments in Jerusalem that are owned by foreigners, which is lovely, and there are people who don't live here who want to own a house in Jerusalem, but it also means that what we've had mainly are luxury buildings going up, because that's what people want, and areas that remain dark during most of the year. And uh, so Jerusalem really needs a major, major cohesive plan. And it sounds like you have come up with a great piece of it. If anyone is listening like like me and saying, well, what can we do? I mean, how, uh, you know, I, I'm not a Knesset member. I have access as, you know, much less than you do. Um, what can we do as people who care about the city, who want to keep the demographics on the Jewish side, but also on a day-to-day level, it's Yerushalayim Shal Mata, not Mala, as they say. It's, it's a real breathing city that needs garbage disposal, that needs school services, that needs to exist. We've had a rise 38% more tourism to Jerusalem this year, which is a wonderful thing. But again, as a guide, I see the infrastructure straining. We don't have enough hotel rooms. You know, we don't, the roads aren't wide enough. Sometimes just to get into the old city can take an hour just for the bus to get around the old city. There's certain limitations, of course, is what we can do because it is an old city. Um, But just there needs to be just one collective. I think with every ministry that there is, in order to really focus on this city and your so aptly named organization, Keep Jerusalem. So what can we as people who care uh, do to, to it, or is there anything that we can do to, to help you move forward with this? Absolutely, Eve. You know, the, there are many plans available to develop Jerusalem into a greater metropolis and to keep, and by doing that, to keep it united. I think the main impediment at the moment is convincing decision makers and opinion leaders around the world, and certainly especially in Israel, to adopt these ideas and to implement them. And implementation is very tough. Just to give you an idea, since the 1967 war, the government uh, took more than 500 decisions relating to Jerusalem, and only 30 of them have been implemented. Um, So that is a really tough one. And as far as we perceive the geopolitics of Jerusalem, it's true about Judea and Samaria, but certainly about Jerusalem, uh, is that we need to try and garner a foreign support in friendly countries like uh, the United States of America and Canada, and now most recently Brazil, who's a big player uh, in, na- in South America. And if we can get those countries to, um, uh, you know, to send the signals to Israel that if Israel uh, passes policies, and in fact, by the way, Two laws have been passed based on our policy paper already. Actually, one law has been passed. One's in the freezer at the moment. But um, if those countries can send out signals to the Prime Minister Netanyahu and to the government that if they implement those policies, they will tacitly support them or at least turn a blind eye or et cetera, that, that would be a great help to us. And this is a whole campaign that I've been planning out and I'm going to be doing in the next year at least. Um, I was in t- Canada recently, met with some members of parliament, and I'm w- we're working on a, on a Jerusalem uh, campaign in Ottawa in the next few months. I was in Brazil in August, met with the uh, son of the future prime, uh, new president of Brazil, Eduardo Bolsonaro, and I gave him a briefing about Jerusalem and about moving the embassy. Two days later, they announced uh, that if he becomes uh, president, he'll move the embassy to Jerusalem and Brazil, hopefully we'll still do that. Bibi is going to be at the inauguration ceremony in an, in another couple of weeks. Um, so the work that we're doing now is, on the one hand, to continue to educate and um, convince Israeli politicians to uh, understand the situation, to to adopt these policy recommendations, and to work towards implementation. On the one hand. And on the other hand, to build up a support infrastructure, a tailwind around the world, but especially in the United States, so that Israel feel, will feel comfortable implementing it. So anybody who can help with meeting politicians or doing Hasbara work, uh, advocacy work in 
whether it's in Jewish or non-Jewish communities, so that the the uh, grassroots and the constituents can swell up and convince their senators, their congressmen, and their leaders to you know to adopt it, to support it publicly, and give Israel the feeling that it can go ahead. That's very important for us, and also certainly. All this work requires extensive funding, um, which you know Keep Jerusalem always tries to raise. We are a non-profit organization that relies entirely on donations of supporters. So the glaringly obvious place that you didn't mention is the EU. Is that just hopeless, or are you trying to convince policymakers there also? Because, for example, you do have the United States already moved their embassy to Jerusalem, which was significant. Australia has said they'll move theirs to West Jerusalem, which is not great, but at least better than Tel Aviv. But the European Union, the Soviet Union, some of the other big countries out there that we do have relations with, um, is, there, is there even hope? Is it a waste of time? The EU is a dismal institution um, made up of a lot of anti-Semites and people that support our enemies or enemy organizations or hostile organizations, and it's very sad, especially because they are committing political and in many ways physical suicide by their policies and by their lack of response or appropriate response to terrorism that's happening in their own countries. Um, So it's very difficult for us to work with the EU, uh, but what we are doing is, and we have identified many dozens of pro-Israel parliamentarians from throughout Europe um, and Eastern Europe who want to help Israel and who are growing steadily in all countries, both Eastern and Western Europe. I met in the summer, I met 60 parliamentarians from all over the world and and from Europe and Eastern Europe, and these are people that the foreign ministry are working with them, we're working with them, and we're trying to create a groundswell of pro-Israel politicians that can impact both upwards into their own leadership and downwards into their own countries and the public opinion in their countries to try and change um, opinions uh, about Israel. But it's a really tough battle, and, but we're not going to give up. Mm-hmm. And we're not alone in it. There, thank God there's the Israeli government and many organizations that are trying to work inside Europe, but given the latent or not so latent anti-Semitism, uh, blatant anti-Semitism, I would say, and, and anti-Israel activities, uh, it's, really, it's really tough. But I believe if we, if we work on the rest of the world, and there are many countries in the world, United States, Canada, South America, China, India, Australia, um, these are countries that we can work with. We've got people um, in, in many of those countries. There's over 20 countries that I'm in touch with and through Christian ministries and through Jewish organizations around the world, um, the pro-Israel camp is growing continually. Wow. Which is great to hear because we usually hear the negative, how much the BDS movement is strong and how much the negatives are. And then I know from myself and from the feedback I get and from my own work, how many, uh, many Christians who are appalled at what's happening here, who also realize that our enemy, the jihadists, are their enemy, wherever they are, and that helping Jerusalem is not just a religious imperative, but also a very practical imperative, because, you know, like, things start in Jerusalem, and uh, but they don't end here. And that helping Jerusalem and keeping Jerusalem is not just for us as Israel, but it's also for them, and it's for the good guys, versus the bad guys. This is a much, much bigger picture than people realize. So do you have a website? How could people get in touch with you? How could they read about some of these plans that you have for the city so that they could bring them to their leaders, as you said, their political leaders, their journalists, and try whatever they can do to get the truth out? Yes, we do have a website called keepjerusalem.org. We actually busy these very days uh, renovating it and fixing it up, but it is there. And uh, we are available to speak around the world if people want us to educate their leaders, their communities, their synagogues, their communi- their uh, ministries or whatever. We are available to, to speak around the world. And I think it's critically important to uh, educate ourselves and our friends around the world about it because, unfortunately, most people are very uninformed or misinformed about the situation. 
And uh, our goal is, to, as I mentioned, is to bring about a situation where the Israeli government will have the courage and the feeling that there's a tailwind supporting them uh, to implement these these decisions, these important moves that need to be made. Well, it looks like, I mean, for sure, within the next year, we're going to have elections here. And this should be a campaign issue. And this should be something that everybody promises, left, right, and center, because Jerusalem is within the consensus, except for the furthest left in Israel and the Arab party. Um, this should be a no-brainer for anybody who's running for prime minister, anybody who's running for Knesset, that we want to hear what are their plans for Jerusalem. And this is a question that every single person who's running for office should be posed at this point. This is a critical year for us here. Absolutely. And in fact, we have an event uh, next week in Israel in Or Yehuda um, on, you know, part, on some of these issues. And, uh, you know, we hope that over the next year, both in the United States and other friendly countries and within Israel, we will be pushing to uh, have Hasbara advocacy information events uh, so that we can bring about these changes that have been largely ignored over the last uh, 20, 30 years. Okay, so um, I, th I think you really illuminated a lot of a lot of the issues about Jerusalem for us here, um, and I know that these days you are you're not sleeping much, and we're sitting here in your office in Jerusalem, and you said to me when I asked if I could come and talk to you, you said, "Look, I'm only in the office in the mornings, and then in the afternoons I go to the hospital." So please, first of all, please tell us what's happening with your daughter Shira, with her husband Amichai, and um, and for those of you, well, I'll let you. I'll let you talk about what happened in the last couple of weeks. So, first thing we we th I think f from the moment I open my eyes and very often during the day is just gratitude to God um, that uh, the angels that shot you know that accompanied those murderous bullets um, managed to avoid um, causing per permanent and fatal damage, which unfortunately other people do were not so lucky. We know that two soldiers were killed and one is uh, critically, still critically injured. And my heart goes out to them and their families. It's, it's a very, very tough situation to be in, heartbreaking and heart-wrenching. On a personal level, we're just very grateful that our kids' lives were saved and that the prospects of their recovery are very good. We don't know if and what permanent damage there will be. We know that our daughter's... Uh, Abdomen and legs uh, were, were very badly injured. Our son-in-law's leg received three bullet wounds, and we, we don't know exactly how well he'll be able to use it. But in relative terms, obviously, um, their lives were saved, and they are in relatively good spirits. They lost their first baby, which is, is shattering, um, but they're alive, and, and we hope you know, they will have the opportunity to bring many more babies into, into the world. So Shira and Amichai continue to improve. Shira had a critical operation a couple of days ago, uh, which closed up her, her 15 centimeter, about a, an eight inch uh, exit wound from the bullet. And uh, this is giving her a lot of pain. And uh, she's been taking painkillers, which are not always helping. And Amichai has uh, also got some pain from the bullet wounds in his leg. We hope that Amichai will start rehabilitation next week and uh, Shira is still going to be in the hospital being monitored for that and other wounds that she has over the next uh, seven or eight days. Where were you when you heard that uh, that they had been shot at the bus stop outside of Ofra on their way home to Elon Moray? I was actually sitting in a meeting in Beit El where I live, uh, a, actually a political meeting. I'm on the city council there. And ironically, I was just talking to my, my co-party member about the uh, defense committee of Bad L and whether we're going to chair it or not chair it. And as we were talking about that, the security committee, I, my friend said to me, wow, there was a terrorist attack in Ofra, outside Ofra. And I said to him, oh my gosh, my kids stand there very often because not only does my daughter and son-in-law you know, take rides and buses from there to Elon Mare, but I've got two other daughters who study in girls' high schools, one in Malele Vona, which is on that route, and the other in Nevet Suf, which is on that route. And, uh, you know, I figured I'll phone just to make sure every, everybody's okay. But before I had the chance to even do that, I saw on my phone my son-in-law calling me, and my heart just dropped to my feet. 
and he was already in the ambulance and he said to me, Abba, um, Shira and I have been shot in this uh, terrorist incident and, uh, and Shira is badly wounded and it just, just, it, it's hard to describe the emotional whirlwind, you know, hurricane that goes on in you when you receive that, that kind of news. And um, the good news he said to me was that Shira was conscious at the time what we found out later from the doctors is that she was actually in a very critical uh, situation, even though she was conscious, because she'd lost a few liters of blood and was literally in a very life-threatening situation. But thanks to many miracles, which are just each one stands on its own, that happened. Her her life was uh, spared. She was kept alive until she reached the hospital and. Um, the doctors at Charette Tedic Hospital performed life-saving surgery and other uh, uh, procedures on her in, in a six-hour operation uh, with 20 doctors and nurses in the operating theater and managed to stabilize her. And a couple of days later, when her eyes opened and she recognized us, was it was a very emotional point. And it was during that surgery that they had to deliver um, deliver your first grandson? Correct. Uh, as is normal procedure, a pregnant woman whose life is in danger, the first thing they do is to take the baby out because both medically and according to Jewish halakha, Jewish law, the life of the mother comes before the baby. And uh, they delivered the baby in a cesarean uh, from the get-go. He, he was in severe and critical condition. In fact, they had to resuscitate him right after they delivered him in the C-section and because he had not received uh, blood or oxygen for the whole period that Shira uh, had been injured for around about an hour since the time that she was uh, uh, shot until they got her out of the uh, uh, casualty, the emergency room, and into the operating theater was about an hour, and the lack of oxygen and blood caused irreparable damage, and even though they tried to keep him alive, after three days he succumbed. It's... There is a question with a child so young. If you even have a funeral, um, how does how does Jewish how does how does that how did that work in this particular case? Um, it's not always that there's actually a funeral for for a child who hasn't lived, I think, even a month. So how was the decision made to um, to actually t- to bury him in in a formal s- a funeral? At the beginning of the process, uh, the media just completely flocked on us and we made a decision that uh, since we'd been put into the situation we have a a kind of shlichut, uh, a kind of mission to share with our brothers and sisters in Israel and the world about this treacherous attack that had been taken place and the anxiety of so many people around the world that want that were following it minute by minute um, to to care and wonder what's what's happening so we decided through the media to share it and literally, the, the response was overwhelming, and there were hundreds of thousands of people, Jews and non-Jews around the world, that were praying for this baby and, and for Shira and Amichai, and, and caring and doing all kinds of good deeds and sending loves and hugs. And it just um, this baby became a, a well-known uh, uh, situation around the world. And when the... the, the Amiad Israel passed away. We consulted um, a, a very great rabbi in Israel, Rav Shmuel Eliyahu, about it, um, whether we should have a funeral or not, and, or give a name, which, as you said, often doesn't happen. And he said, because this baby was prayed about, prayed for, and became almost public property to, in, in a certain way, he should have a funeral and a name. And uh, and so we decided to do that, and we went up to our children, Amichai and Shiru, who were lying in the intensive care unit, and we said, you know, after we broke the, you know, the, the terrible news to them that their baby had passed away, which was just heartbreaking and very, very difficult to do, and then we had to give them the further, <laughs> further task of saying, you know what, we want you to give, the, give him a name also. And they had about 10 or 15 minutes to think of, of a name. Uh, you know, obviously they thought of other names before, you know, when they thought they would 
have a healthy baby after nine months. But that is, they knew that they wanted to give the baby a more significant name that also um, expressed the um, the eternity of the nation and the Jew- of Israel and the Jewish people and the land of Israel. And and they came up with this name Amiad Israel, which means my nation um, is forever. The nation of Israel is forever, and we just we're just overwhelmed by the um, sensitivity and by the uh, um, you know the the uh, uh, f- f- the the wisdom of of giving that name. And uh, we saw how that name caught amongst the Jewish people and around the world and the funeral itself was 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 a very difficult but unique uh, event because it helped everybody share in our grief which was which strengthened us but also sent out very important messages to to the Israel to the government and to around the world so my um I have a son named Amiad who was the first of our children to be born in Israel. We named him Amiyad Azarel, which means my nation is eternal with the help of Hashem. So those sentiments, I think, in Amiyad Yisrael, it's it's an amazing name, Amiyad. It really is. It expresses so much of what we feel. Um, And um, I I was guiding last week a synagogue from Toronto, and one of the people on the trip was actually cousins and very close, more like a sister, really, with your mechutenet, with your your son-in-law's family, with his mother, and so they spent time at the hospital. They also went. They also went to the funeral, and they were talking to me about it afterwards. And one of the things that she said to me brought to mind something that happened in our family, in the Harrow family, seventeen and a half years ago, when my niece Batsheva Shoham and her husband Benny also they buried their baby. He was five months old, Yehuda. He was murdered by a rock through the windshield. And I remember sitting in the hospital with them at the time and he, he lingered for five days, um, from mass died of massive brain damage. And I remember looking around at the hospital and thinking, there were Arab children being treated in this hospital. There are Arabs everywhere in the hospital. And I thought, what is wrong with us? I mean, here we are suffering from Arab terrorism and yet in the hospital, patients, doctors, staff, of essentially of the nation of our enemy or not. And I thought, you know, if this was going to be, if this was happening anywhere else in the Middle East, a Jewish baby would not be treated properly in an Arab hospital, and certainly you couldn't reverse the situation. And then I thought to myself, wow, I'm so glad there were us and not them, and that this is what we do, that even in the most difficult of circumstances, this is how humane and wonderful we are. And this cousin said the exact same thing to me without even knowing. She said to me before they left, she said, you know, I went to the hospital and I couldn't believe what I saw. And she said, and I thought maybe we're crazy. And then she said, no, this is the Jewish people. This is who we are. We're not going to sink to the level of our enemies. And I have to say that not once in this entire conversation that we've had, and this just echoes other conversations that I've had with people, have I heard a word of hatred from you about there's no like revenge let's run into the next era village and 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 beat them up or do something because of what they did to our family it's been about uniting the jewish people be it having a public funeral where you could have not had one and that would have been just fine in terms of jewish law but deciding to do that with all of the grief made so much more raw because this baby had united the people and because people had come closer to God because of him with all the prayers and good deeds that were done in in the hope that he would recover and that are still being done um, in order that your children shall recover. That's an amazing thing that I think we do not appreciate enough. And that's why I am also sure that whatever happens at the end of the day, the Jewish people aren't going anywhere and we're not leaving our land. And we have a lot to do here, as you described, on a day-to-day level. There's politics, there's diplomacy, there's borders, there's schools, there's jobs, there's all of that. But in the big picture, we have never lost faith, and we are so fine. We are so amazing. And for you, your family would have had every excuse this week to be angry also with God and with everything. Why us? Why what? What happened here? Not a word of it. If anything, and I was watching you and your wife also on Facebook, you put out small videos just love, just prayers, just deepening your faith. 
how do you do that when when you must be so distraught and devastated and and perhaps it's even worse because it's happening to your children it's one thing when bad things happen to us but it, when it's happening to our children, there's a, at least I have felt, there's a sense of helplessness because we can't do this for them. We can't get them through the grief. They're going to have to do this themselves. All we can do is give them as much love and support as we can. So where does this come from? How do you train for a day like this, which is everybody's nightmare here in the land of Israel? Uh, it's hard to answer the question. I must tell you that the overwhelming support, love, um, both material and emotional and spiritual, that we received from so many thousands of people gives us strength. But also the education that we receive as residents of Judea and Samaria, um, who are great, we great idealists and ideologues who believe in the Rock of Israel, the Torah of Israel, and the land of Israel, and the people of Israel, that education that we've been, you know, um, nourishing in ourselves for so many years has given us incredible internal strength. And we are not unique. Unfortunately, many Jews who've been through similar situations have sh- exhibited unbelievable moral and emotional and, and faith uh, and strength, you know, growing from these, these terrible episodes because we understand the greater picture. And the greater picture is that the Jewish people are coming back to the land of Israel, fulfilling the words of the prophets, building up the land of Israel, moving towards the redemptive era. era. And, and this is inspiring, and this is our, our core belief. And it's true that we have tragedies uh, and, and very challenging times on, the, on that road, uh, but we're aware that that's the divine plan, that it's not going to be smooth. And we just uh, try and understand these these uh, events as uh, as ways to strengthen our resolve and not to bring us down, but to use it as a way to, as you said, bring us closer to God, strengthen our own people, strengthen uh, whoever uh, identifies with it, so that we can move with with more resolve and more determination towards uh, achieving those goals. Uh, in addition to that, in our particular circumstance, the unbelievable miracles that happened that saved our children uh, give us further strength. I'll just give you two or two or so examples. Um, number one, um, when the terrorists stopped and shot at our children, um, Shira, as I mentioned, was shot in her lower abdomen and her femoral artery and vein were both ruptured. Um, and if you know anything about it, Within minutes, you could be dead from that. And her husband, Amit Amichai, even though he'd been shot in the leg, saw her bleeding and first of all thought the terrorists were still shooting. And he jumped on top of her to protect her and what he thought the baby, uh, first and foremost. Uh, then when he heard that there was no more shots and she was bleeding profusely, he um, pushed his hand into the wound and, and tried to stop the blood, even though she'd already lost about two liters of blood in a very short period of time. Then the paramedics came, uh, an amazing guy uh, who I know, Betzal Ben Chamu, and he happened to be, uh, coincidentally or not coincidentally, there's an Amada, an MDA station right in Ofra, and he came and he continued to, uh, to, to try and stop the bleeding. Um, the Adelson family had uh, donated five armored ambulances to Judea and Samaria, and one of them, coincidentally or not coincidentally, happened to be at Ofra. And the, the medics realized that they needed to get Shira to the hospital in record time because she was still, even though they were trying to stop the wound, that she was still losing blood and had lost almost half her blood in her body. And there, unfortunately, uh, are great traffic jams um, that, um, mm-hmm. that block the road from... Uh, Judea and Samaria to Jerusalem and not all cars understand or cooperate when ambulances have their sirens on. And there is a route, a a special road that the army uses exclusively that passes through some Arab villages and refugee camps, which is only available to bulletproof vehicles. And the ambulance, uh, which happened to be there, so-called coincidentally, which was armored, uh, called the army and the army because it was armored and because it had 
uh, special medications and equipment, which also helped save Shira's life because the old ambulances did not have that medication equ- equipment, uh, got permission to drive through that uh, special security road and in fact made it from Ofra to the Shira Tzedek Hospital in 19 minutes, wow. which took me yesterday about an hour and a quarter in the, in the traffic. So that just is an example of one incredible miracle that happened. Um, and certainly those kind of uh, uh, displays of divine providence give us, give us immense strength. And you focus on the miracles, and you focus on the good things that happened and, and deal with the tragedy, but that's not, that's not the focal point in the overall picture. And that in itself is a choice. Um, Unfortunately, we live in a region where people make different choices, where bad things happen to them, either for their own fault or not. It doesn't matter. And they, they choose to wage more war and more terror and to make the world a worse place. You know, um, the media, uh, when at one of the press conferences, uh, asked us, what do we think of the fact that, thank God, the army caught the terrorist that perpetrated the attack and eliminated him? And my answer to them was that I, on a personal level, I don't care um, that they killed him. Um, you know, I don't have that personal drive for revenge. But on a national level, I think it was very important that they, they got him and that they killed him. Because what we need to return to our country, and I said this to the prime minister and to the government in many times of the various times I was interviewed in the media, we have to return deterrence because the terrorists have to know that there is a price for this terrible, uh, murderous, and merciless, vile actions that they are doing against our people, attacking innocent pregnant women and men uh, on the roads. And returning deterrence and providing strong and forceful responses is, uh, is a very merciful thing to do. Um, it's not my you know, personal desire for revenge, but it's my personal desire to give security and safety to the brave people that are living in Judea and Samaria and and over the rest of Israel. So, yes, I was happy, very happy that this terrorist was eliminated because hopefully, together with all the other, um, you know, activities that the army and the security forces are doing, will maybe in some way strengthen and return the deterrence and save more lives. Okay, Chaim Silverstein, I'll let you get back to work or probably now to the hospital. Um, It's going to be a long road back for them, and uh, I know that not everything that they're going to need is going to get covered by the government. If people are listening and want to help um, be a part, a practical part, in addition to the prayers, of their recovery, is there anywhere, is there a fund or anything that they can give to that will help this couple in the months and possibly in the years to come? Yes, unfortunately, there there are mounting expenses uh, as a result of this terrible tragedy. One of them is our desire to buy our children a car uh, because we do not want them standing at bus stops and and hitchhiking uh, stands around Judea and Samaria where we all live. Uh, Also, we don't even know if their medical situation will enable them to stand or to walk. Uh, We hope it will. Um, And that is one a campaign that some of our friends friends have, have launched recently to help them buy a car and a lot of other things that they're going to need in, in the coming months and years. Um, friends of ours have set up a kind of fund me uh, site. I think it's through Mighty Cause. Um, I presume there's a website called Mighty Cause and uh, at the Reha- Rehabilitation of Shira and Amichai Fund. And there you have the uh, option to click on uh, one of the numbers they supply there or to click on custom if you want to give a different uh, donation. It's a tax-deductible donation going through the uh, channel of the Central Fund of Israel. And uh, we would be very, very appreciative if people would help and support that. So that's something I think that we all need to participate in. And if you are a little confused, you didn't catch that, you can, of course, always write to me, eve at thelandofisrael.com. You can write to me anyway, in general, about any any comment that you have to make. I'm always 
so glad to hear um, from all of you. So I just want to thank you, Chaim, for, um, for speaking to me today, for the work that you continue to do for Jerusalem, and for your faith in a time where it's, you've really been tested. And I think that you and your family, um, in this terrible tragedy that's happened to you, have inspired many of us to be better, to do better, to come closer to Hashem, to bring our people closer to each other. Um, because if you can do that uh, in such a difficult time, then the rest of us really have no excuse. So I want to thank you for everything that you do and that you will continue to do. And of course, from the bottom of my heart, full recovery for Shira and Frami Chai. And we are all looking forward, and all everyone else who has been hurt for the past years, there's many people still suffering many, many years down the line from injuries that they suffered from terrorism. And I know that we are all looking forward to um, seeing them interviewed in years to come in a house full of children. So thank you again. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, thanks to Ben and to Tabitha and everybody at the station. And uh, that's it. Eve Harrow Rejuvenation on the Land of Israel Network. Take care, everybody. Goodbye for now. You're listening to the Land of 